Funding for this video was provided by our gold tier patrons. Thank you so much to A-Beat and Pyrite. This video will contain spoilers for Infamous Second Son. If you've never played this game before, I still recommend you watch this video just a little, as the fun of Infamous doesn't really come from completing the story or the surprises it has in store for you, but instead it comes from the pure fun of using the powers the game gives you. Enjoy. Infamous Second Son is the third game in the Infamous franchise. The first Infamous came out and it was really good, and I think you guys can all agree with that. Then the second Infamous came out and it improved on nearly everything from the original despite still having some glaring issues. The Infamous games were some of the best games on the PlayStation 3 and are still must-play titles to this day. With the next generation of consoles coming around the corner though, it was very important to have a real console seller right out of the gate. And Sony's answer to this, or more accurately Sucker Punch's answer to this, was Infamous Second Son. Unfortunately, this game, as far as I've seen, has left the fanbase a little divided, with a lot of people saying things like the powers are underdeveloped and the gameplay isn't as fun as previous games and that the characters aren't very good. I, however, disagree. I think it's time somebody took more of a positive approach to this game to hopefully make you see it from a different perspective. I want to clarify that I am a little biased here, because this is easily my favorite game of all time, being rivaled only by Spider-Man PS4 and Persona 5, but just because I love this game doesn't mean that I'm going to go easy on it. I want to talk about this game from pretty much top to bottom, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I also want to make it clear that I won't be talking about the first and second Infamous games very much, as I don't want this to be a comparison. I just want to look at Second Son in a vacuum. With that being said, let's talk about why I like this game so much, and maybe convince you that it's not as bad as everyone says. This video is definitely going to be a longer one than usual, so for that reason I'll be very clearly splitting this video into different parts, separating presentation and gameplay and so on. So I feel before we get started we should set up some context to the game as it is a direct sequel to Infamous 2. Infamous 1 stars Cole McGrath, who is tasked to deliver a package that ends up exploding in his bag in the middle of Empire City. Afterwards, he gains power over electricity and is tasked with taking down the other superpowered beings called conduits that are causing havoc in the city. There's a morality system in the game, but the developers have confirmed that the canon for the story is the Good Karma playthrough of both the first and second game, as that's what most players did on their first playthrough. Anywho, after saving the city from these conduits and having a run-in with his future self who tells him of a conduit called the Beast, the game ends and we are thrust into Infamous 2, where the beast wrecks havoc on the world, and Cole moves to New Marais to prepare, and by the end of the game, he sacrifices himself in order to stop the beast. Unfortunately, this also killed a majority of conduits in the blast radius, leading to the events of Infamous Second Son. Now, I know that was an extreme oversimplification of the story, but like I said, I want to focus on Second Son in a vacuum and not make many comparisons to Infamous 1 or 2. Anyways, seven years after the events of Infamous 2, the number of conduits is at an all-time low, and the Department of Unified Protection is an organization built to capture and contain conduits, and they have occupied Seattle. Unfortunately for them, a new conduit named Delson Rowe shows up and has a plot to stop the leader of the DUP, whose name is Brooke Augustine. He does this through the use of his new powers, smoke, neon, and video. As far as the story goes, that's really all you need to know for now, and I promise we'll be taking a much deeper look at the story and its characters, but it's best we talk about the presentation and gameplay for now. This game, despite releasing in 2014, still looks gorgeous, and the visuals with some of the powers are still stunning. The cutscenes in this game look amazing, with characters' faces and actions all looking real and believable. It's clear from the presentation alone that this game is very much grounded in reality, of course, aside from the whole superpower thing. The buildings all have good design to them and don't really feel samey. The cars driving around all look realistic, and this combined with the civilians walking around definitely adds this feeling of really being in Seattle. And yes, the Space Needle is in the game, and yes, it looks amazing. Something a lot of open world games can struggle with when it comes to a sense of verticality is the tops of buildings. A lot of buildings can feel empty or boring, but the rooftops in Second Sun don't fall into this aspect, as the rooftops all look real, with mold on the ground, vents sticking out, satellite dishes, pipes, and skylights littering the rooftops, which gives them a very lived-in feel. There's graffiti on the walls of buildings, posters and other debris on the floor, garbage bins and plants along the walls, and the garbage bags outside of the garbage bins give the world that extra bit of detail it needs. Stores have modeled interiors and while they aren't full-blown interiors, they have enough detail like this coffee shop here where there's even an open sign, a 
Wi-Fi sign, and there's a counter with a cash register and a bench and even a chalkboard with the specials on it. Granted, a lot of these interiors are copy and pasted, but just having something like this adds a layer of depth to the world. A bunch of stores have actual names to them too, like Kalani and Kai Bubble Tea or Gabe and Bren's Ninja Academy. Don't worry though, there are still plenty of businesses like my favorite hotel to stay at when I'm in Seattle, Hotel. The design of the very buildings themselves are great too, with even the windows having variety, and they do a really good job of not just feeling like a big brick block. Even the streets have puddles in the ground, leaves clutter the sidewalks, and even the fire hydrants, street lamps, and electrical boxes have an incredible amount of detail, and don't really feel out of place. For a very detailed example, let's look at a single rooftop in the game. Here you can see a man walking along the building and... Um... Okay, let's move on. There's cardboard boxes in the corner and a rope on the ground, and next to that there's some leaves hanging over the edge, and next to the vent and the satellite dish there's a billboard, and a smokestack next to an AC unit, and on the other side there's a nice patio set with an umbrella, some plants, a skylight, and you can even see what looks to like some slight mold forming at the edge of the building. And this is just one of the rooftops in the game, and it perfectly illustrates how the city feels lived in, and how the rooftops feel lived in without feeling cluttered. It doesn't really feel like they have things on top of the rooftops, just for the sake of having things on top of the roof. I think I've gone on long enough about the design of Seattle and how incredible it is, but it's really important to mention because I feel like the world sort of gets looked over in this game since you wouldn't notice the details when you're dashing around taking out DUP soldiers. It's clear that this game wanted to push the PlayStation 4 to its limits, and it does so with flying colors, or more specifically, flying colors of smoke, video, and neon. Speaking of such flying colors, the game's lighting engine works pretty well most of the time. The effects like smoke and video look great no matter what, but the neon power has a bit of an issue with it. It's clear based on how much light is on screen that the game adjusts its visuals, however, for some reason when using the neon power, sometimes the lights on screen are so bright that it almost looks like an Ubisoft loading screen. I'm not sure why it happens, and this could be a problem only for me, but bottom line, it does happen. It's unfortunate that this happens, because the powers in this game all look spectacular, with particle effects, lights, and general chaos taking center stage. In fairness, it doesn't happen often, but it happens enough for me that I feel like it's necessary to mention it. The designs of the DUP towers and the soldiers look good, and the enemies have enough variety to them for them to not feel too basic. The general color scheme for the DUP is black, grey, and yellow, which I feel was an intentional design choice. It reflects the neutral state of the DUP. Depending on the choices you make and the level of your karma, Delson will have the color scheme of white and blue or black and red. So having the DUP be a shade of yellow or having their powers give off a yellow light makes them always easy to identify and allows you to never lose track of what's going on. None of the civilians wear this yellow either, so when you're trying to be a hero and trying to avoid shooting civilians, it's easy for your eyes to lock onto the color yellow and quickly focus in. I could be looking too far into this though. With so many effects on screen at once, it's common for a game to fluctuate in the FPS department. You can't really see it on the video here because everything was captured in 30 frames per second, but the game constantly fluctuates between 60 and 30 FPS, leading to some jarring drops, though this is somewhat alleviated if you cap the frame rate to 30 FPS, which is thank god an option in the menu. Even playing on a PS4 Pro doesn't save you from some of the frame drop. For example, I had the game consistently drop at a scene where a few enemies show up and trap you. Both times I played this mission, the frames dropped. Granted, that was the most noticeable and lowest frame drop in the game that I had seen, but it's not the only example of the unstable frame rate. In fairness, the frame rate never dropped low enough to get in the way, and I understand that the way I talk about it makes it seem like the frames are dropping all the time, but it's truly not a common occurrence, and it only happens when things get super crazy. The UI in the game also really fits in with the rugged, rebellious nature of the game and its characters. The UI doesn't get in the way ever, and it does a great job of not being too eye-catching, but also giving you all the information you need. The menu for some reason looks really neat and tidy, which stylistically clashes with the rest of the game's menus. It by no means looks bad, and it clearly is meant to be in the style of a surveillance report on Delson, but I wonder if it would have looked better had it been in the style of every other UI asset in the game. I'm not saying it looks bad by any means though, I just really want to clarify that. Something that definitely looks good in this game though is the powers. Smoke has a lot of finesse to it as you dash from vents to enemies, and the way you dash forward into an enemy, disappearing into a cloud of smoke only to reappear in front of them, only to slam them to the ground looks so cool. The way Delson splits into different lines of smoke when dashing is an animation that truly never gets old, and that combined with his smoke thrusters makes getting around complete eye candy. Delson's chain is slightly modified to have a fiery cinder coming off of it, making it look super badass. The little puffs of smoke he shoots out of his hand really feel like they do some damage too, and the cinder missiles feel so powerful and have so much weight to them. Sniping a satellite tower from hundreds of feet away with one of these missiles is incredibly fun too. The way the sulfur bombs and cinder blasts look is awesome as well, but I won't spend all day talking about it. You can get the point by just sort of seeing it on screen. One 
One move that I really want to look at is the orbital drop, one of the karmic super moves in the game. Delson charges up and shoots himself into the air through three balls of smoke and reappears at the apex of his jump. Once up there, he gets his little smirk on his face, which says a lot about the character and how he enjoys and also knows that he is about to devastate a convoy of the DUP. He then, through the use of his smoke thrusters, accelerates towards the ground, hitting it head on and disappearing into an explosion of smoke, leaving a crater in the ground. All the while, this is happening in beautiful slow motion. After the attack is done, there's ash floating around in the air within the vicinity, and the entire atmosphere from this attack is presented spectacularly. The video power looks just as good as the others, as it glitches out Delson and all the attacks have such an aggressive feel to them. Instead of his signature chain, he wields a massive sword if you have good karma, or these awesome claws if you have bad karma. Whenever he does an attack, there's a glitched out effect, and this glitch effect changes color based on your karmic state, with the game not only having different powers for you, but different colors, such as the color of your clothes mentioned earlier. We can talk more about the different karma specific powers once we get into the gameplay, but as far as video goes presentation wise, everything from the bits fired from your hands to the swords you summon onto an enemy look awesome. The way Delson has a special glitch effect when going invisible helps you not lose track of him while amidst combat. The super move for video is a spectacular hellstorm where you summon angels and demons that bombard whatever is in front of you. Finally, with Neon, this is all about being fast and bright. Every move is so bright and quick, such as the dash, which is literally just turning into a skeleton of neon light that speeds across the city and even up walls. The chain is now a neon sword, and the sulfur bomb is now traded for a stasis bomb, where any enemies caught in it will be stuck in time. You can also target a weak point that'll either evaporate an enemy or subdue them, depending on where you hit them. The Neon Super Move is a radial burst that sees Delson suspending everyone in the immediate vicinity in stasis, and Delson shoots a rapid fire of neon lasers which explode upon impact, leaving the area around him in a fluorescent destruction. As far as animations go, you've probably seen that they look really good, but cutscenes are a whole nother level. Characters' faces convey a myriad of information, and the faces don't fall into the uncanny valley. The way Delson's jacket moves with him is done very well, and the animations of him falling look somehow just as cool as when he's kicking the enemy's ass. As far as other trivial animations go, such as the walk and run cycle, I think you've seen it on screen enough for you to see that they look good, and I don't really have much to say about the animations other than they all really look good. So I think we've talked about how the game looks, and it's clear that the isolated animations and assets look great, and when it's all put together with the world and the overall presentation, it forms something much greater than the sum of its parts. So I think now it's best that we talk about the gameplay. Let's start with the powers at your disposal. The different powers have different uses and support different playstyles. Smoke is all about finesse and being a good all-rounder. As far as traversal, it's the weakest of the bunch, but for traversal it makes up in its style. The smoke dash is an incredibly stylish way of getting around, and you can dash into red vents on the side of buildings and shoot out from the other side, making scaling the buildings in Seattle very quick and fancy. The dash works well in combat too, as it makes you hard to hit while in the dash, and dashing up a building can create some distance between you and the enemy. The basic smoke shot that you get does do a good amount of damage, but isn't as powerful as the video torrent and isn't as accurate as the neon bolts. You can charge a basic smoke shot to use a cinder blast, which can be really useful for crowd control and doing some extra damage to the heavier enemies. The cinder missiles also fall into the common theme of this power as it is a middle of the road power where you fire a large smoke missile that is less accurate than the charged neon bolts and are technically less powerful than the homing swords, but they definitely have their uses. The cinder missiles also have a very clear drop off point, and it was always a cool feeling when I would snipe a satellite dish from hundreds of feet away like I mentioned earlier. The sulfur bombs will be your best friend when it comes to earning good karma, as the bombs create a cloud of thick and heavy smoke, and when an enemy is caught within the cloud, it leaves them stunned, allowing you to subdue or execute them. The smoke variation of the chain is sufficient for a lot of grunts, but won't do you well when it comes to the beefier enemies and bosses. Finally, the orbital drop is the devastating super move that I've mentioned earlier, and it absolutely decimates an area. I don't have much to say about it other than it's a great emergency move for when you're in a tight spot and need to clear out an area fast. Smoke, as far as powers go, is easily my favorite of the bunch as it is, in my opinion, the most stylish way to take out your enemies, and while it might not be the most efficient in the aspects of damage or traversal, it is just a really neat power. Say you want a little more precision and speed to your attacks, Neon might be a little better suited for you. The color of the Neon powers are more blue or red depending on your karmic rank, but either color scheme has a nice fluorescent pink to it. The Neon dash is fast and stylish enough that it makes it easily the best power for traversal. Being able to run through the streets and up buildings at the same time at the speed of a car is always fun, though I wish you could move a little bit faster. 
character. I understand that increasing the speed might make combat a little too chaotic, and since dashing away from enemies is a common strategy for Neon, making it too fast might negatively affect the gameplay. But maybe you could have a system where after sprinting for a second or something, a little burst effect would take place and you would receive a boost. I'm sure another reason why the dash isn't super fast is because there could be an issue with Delson moving into parts of the world so fast that the game can't properly load it in. And this isn't really a nitpick or a criticism against the game, it's just something I've always wanted to talk about. Getting back on track though, the Neon Dash is a great power even if it is a little automated. The reason I say it's automated is because when traversing with Neon there isn't much complexity to the movement. You just sort of hold circle and point yourself in the direction you want to go. With Smoke it's a little more complicated as getting to where you need to be takes a combination of vent dashing, smoke dashing, thrusters, and even then it's not like traversal is some sort of puzzle in itself. Moving on though, the basic Neon Shot is a quick and accurate bolt of Neon that works great for targeting weak points, which is an upgrade that you'll get eventually. When aiming in, you can either target an enemy's head to make them explode into a miniature light show, or you could aim for their leg, which will automatically subdue them. With more upgrades, you can go into a focus mode when aiming in, where for a short amount of time, the game slows down and you can very quickly target the weak points with precision. If you want a little more power without sacrificing too much accuracy, then the charged neon bolt will do the job well, as it does a good amount of damage and works well on targeting single enemies. Next up is the stasis bubble, which can work well for dispatching large compact groups of enemies as everyone caught in the explosion is trapped in a bubble, where time is slowed, making them easy to take down. I unfortunately didn't really use this move very much, as I felt it was easier to just shoot the enemies, because most of the time the enemies will just stand still when shooting at you, however when in the stasis bubble, they're being thrown back by the explosion, making them kind of harder to hit because it's a moving target. Even when it comes to earning karma, it was easier to just use a sulfur bomb to quickly subdue a large group of enemies. Finally, for those who want a little more aggression, you might want to try the third power at Delson's disposal. Video. The video power is definitely the most aggressive of the bunch, as it takes inspiration from the fictional video game Heaven's Hellfire, which means a few of the video attacks involve summoning demons and angels depending on your karma. As for traversal, you do get some digital wings that can be used to scale buildings and essentially fly for a short amount of time, making this a great power for moving from the rooftops of the huge skyscrapers in downtown. I would say that this dash is definitely my least favorite though, as it lacks a sense of style that the other two have, but that by no means makes it a bad dash, as it is still pretty useful for not only getting around, but quickly getting out of a sticky situation in combat. Speaking of combat, your main way to attack is the BitTorrent, which is a rapid fire stream of whatever this is, and it does a great amount of damage, and it really feels like you're just pummeling the enemy with the power of being a gamer. Another move you can do with this power is summon bloodthirsty blades that follow the path that you set it on, which can be applied to the enemies and even helicopters. This attack is easily the best in the game, as it's more powerful than the cinder missiles and arguably more accurate than the charged neon shot. Next up is the variation of your chain, which is now a massive sword that feels so powerful as Delson really throws his entire weight into it. However, if you have evil karma, then he'll use the claws like I mentioned earlier. The attacks are the slowest of the chain variations, but are definitely the most powerful and look really cool. Next up is definitely one of the cooler and more useful powers you'll get in the game, which is the Shroud of Invisibility. When pressing L1, you can go completely invisible, allowing you to stealthily kill or subdue your enemy. Thankfully, you can't just spam it too much as it uses a significant amount of your power, and after doing any other attack, it cancels the invisibility, including the sneak attack on an enemy. The way that they handle this potentially overpowered move is really well done, as it's always a viable option but not always the best option, as you can't go invisible when an enemy is too close to you, so long story short, they do a very good job of not letting this be an easy win option for you. Eventually with upgrades you can summon some angels and demons that fight for you when you turn invisible, so overall this move is just really cool. One thing I didn't mention when talking about the different powers is the different variations of the thrusters as they don't really change, that is except for the video thrusters. With a certain upgrade you can gain more speed when gliding forward with video, and then pull back with the right stick to swoop up, which makes the traversal with video so much fun. The ground pound in the game, however, works the same no matter what powers you're using. The powers in the game really are center stage, and it's good that they are all somewhat varied, however, they do border on being repetitive. What I'm trying to say is that all the powers follow a specific structure, with small changes, however, these small changes make a big difference in the grand scheme of things, as when you're rushing to your next objective, it would be more efficient to quickly run over to a neon sign and then dash over to your objective, or it might be a good idea to switch to smoke when you see a group of enemies all within close proximity, as a cinder missile would easily wipe them out. And the way the game places its smoke stacks, neon signs, and TV screens within the world are well crafted, as there's always a power source nearby, but they're spread out enough that mid-fight you might be better off to switch to a new power and adapt, rather than look for another neon sign. A common complaint with the powers is that they all feel like smoke with a different cone of paint, and while I can totally see where you're coming from, and I definitely think that there is room to make these power sets more unique, I think what we have is still really good, and the powers are different enough that they have their uses. Also, having things such as a strong missile type attack mapped to R1 for all the powers allows the powers to all feel familiar. 
I'm curious what your guys' favorite power was. Please let me know in the comments. As mentioned before, mine is definitely smoke. You can upgrade these powers through the use of blast shards hidden around the map within security drones and scanning stations. Of course, the game could have used an experience system, but I like how they handled the blast shards as they show up on the map and there are enough scattered around that you'll have a majority of upgrades by the end of the game by just picking them up as you see them. They also aren't hidden in any strange spots, which is nice. Gameplay has a very basic loop to it. Go to an objective, fry some dupes, maybe have a boss battle or a mini boss, and that's it. The missions in the game do put some twists on this, such as one where you have to take out some enemies on the Space Needle, and in order to do so, you scale the Space Needle and do an orbital drop at the top of it in order to take out the DUP's communications. Another sees you taking pictures of a crime scene and sending it to your brother Reggie, while also clearing the area of anyone interfering. Another mission involves you clearing out a dock full of drug dealers with Fetch and tagging the drug houses so that Fetch can blow them up. Boss fights in the game, however, are few and far between. Between. There are a few mini bosses with beefed up DUP agents, but there are only three boss fights in the game. The beginning one with Hank doesn't really count because it lasts all of 10 seconds, but anyways, the boss fight with Fetch is a very cool one as you end up in an abandoned theater with a bunch of neon signs everywhere. You can attack Fetch, but when you do, she'll just heal herself from the neon signs, so your first objective is to drain all of them for yourself while avoiding her attacks. Then after that, you have to take her out with your own neon beams. The boss fight is pretty basic, but I think that's okay because it's with a brand new power and it's still reasonably early in the game, so I won't fault it too much for being basic. The next boss battle is against He Who Dwells, which is really quick, such a cool boss name. Good job, guys. This boss fight is way cooler because he's massive and he has such a large enough health bar to make the fight feel like a real David and Goliath battle, but not such a large health bar that it feels like a damage sponge. You initiate the fight by walking towards a TV where you get sucked into it and after doing some damage to the boss, you get thrown out back into the warehouse, where you then have to find another TV to jump back in. Eventually, when you do enough damage to the boss, he'll split into a bunch of angels and fly to another portion of the map. Shooting these angels will allow you to get some easy damage in. Eventually, the boss will also have angels that shield him, adding an extra layer to the fight. The fight in itself, aside from being eye candy, is still pretty basic. I wish there was a little more to it, but for what we have, it's pretty good. There are a ton of side activities in the game, and while they're not necessarily super gameplay heavy, they are a decent distraction and some of them contain some really juicy bits of lore. The game's map is split up into multiple different districts, and each district has a certain level of DUP occupancy. In order to lower this occupancy, you can do some side activities such as finding audio logs from a rogue DUP informant or seeking out undercover DUP agents or shooting out the cameras littered around the map. You could also destroy the conduit scanning stations around the map and even do some graffiti. Of course, these side activities can't be initiated until you take out the district's mobile command center. These are really cool as it's basically just a bunch of dupes in an area and you just have to go in and clean house. And once you're finished, you blow up the command center and you can start your push against the DUP. The scanning stations around Seattle are one of the ways you can push the DUP out. And the scanners are powered by blast shards, so that's a plus too. These are pretty easy to do as you just drop a cinder missile on the scanner and head on out. But the next side mission is the hidden cameras hidden around Seattle, which can be taken out at any point, but on top of the big cameras hidden around, there are also really tiny ones that you can take out too by tapping into the camera through your phone. These camera puzzles are easy, and as far as puzzles go, not very challenging, but as far as side quests go, they were never annoying. Up next are the secret agents around Seattle. Go into an area and look for an undercover DUP agent using the picture on screen and take them out. The task is basic, but semi-entertaining, and honestly, it doesn't really do much. The last of the bunch, and definitely the most fun out of the bunch, is the stencil art. Head up to a blank wall and start spray painting it with either a positive or negative piece of art. The individual pieces of art are really well done and unique, however some of the quote unquote negative or evil spray paints don't really convey a negative feeling. I would assume that the point of having a good piece of graffiti is one that inflicts a sense of joy or positivity, and the evil one is meant to be some sort of social mockery, but most of the time, the evil and good stencil arts can be interchangeable. For example, we have one here in Uptown where the evil version of the art is a guy catching the fish and making sushi, however, the good one is a cat catching the fish. It would be very easy to see the guy making sushi as the good karma one, just as much as it was the cat. Maybe I'm just not getting it, and maybe there's a much deeper layer of social commentary than I'm missing here. It really doesn't matter, but I do wish that there was a clear difference between the good and bad stencil art, apart from the change in color. Nonetheless, the entertainment does come from seeing the works of art at the end, regardless of what end of the morality spectrum it falls on. Finally, once a number of these tasks are done, you can initiate a district 
showdown where you tag a local billboard and call the DUP helpline to taunt the DUP. The annoyance of the DUP receptionist increases as you tag more billboards and Delson's cheeky comments get better and better too. I do however have a few issues with these showdowns. The biggest issue is that they are generally pretty underwhelming. The mobile command center is usually more difficult and more dense with enemies which confuses me considering that as far as gameplay goes, the showdown is meant to be the DUP's final stand in a district, yet they only send like 5 troops or in some cases a single helicopter at you. These should be huge blowouts where there's 5 helicopters in the sky and a ton of soldiers with rocket launchers and it's a perfect opportunity for the game to have a full on balls to the wall showdown, but it just doesn't take the opportunity. I also don't know why Delson's dialogue is the same regardless of his karmic rank. I would assume true hero Delson would have different, less aggressive dialogue than the infamous Delson, but no, the dialogue is the same no matter what. Hi, you have reached the DUP helpline. Do you have a bioterrorist incident to report? You will not believe. Mr. Rowe, knock it off! Hi, you have reached the DUP helpline. Do you have a bioterrorist incident to report? You will not believe. Mr. Rowe, knock it off! The karma system is something that I've been putting off for a little bit now because it directly ties into the story and its characters, so why don't we move on to it, as nearly everything you do in the game revolves around this very system. That is, in my opinion, pretty good if not linear and in some cases a little flawed. As fans may know, the infamous series revolves around good and bad karma. Good karma can be gained by subduing enemies with non-lethal tactics and making heroic decisions. Bad karma, on the other hand, as you might expect, is earned by making evil, villainous decisions, using your powers against civilians and being as lethal as possible. The system works great during gameplay as it changes the way you interact with the world and it changes the way you approach the tasks in front of you. For example, on a good playthrough you would be a little more slow and methodical with your approach as to not hurt civilians or to properly subdue your targets, rather than just kill them. With bad karma however, you will likely find yourself flying by the seat of your pants as it doesn't really matter how many innocents are hurt during your rampage. The amount of karma that you have is reflected on your karmic rank, with the good karma ranks consisting of protector, guardian, champion, paragon, and the penultimate true hero, and the bad karma ranks consist of thug, criminal, bioterrorist, most wanted, and infamous, with the neutral rank at the beginning of the game being Vandal. There's a myriad of tasks and little things that you can do to increase your karma, and I think it's best we start with the activities that earn you good karma. In order to earn good karma, you can subdue enemies through the use of your powers, healing injured civilians, and stopping drug busts. Other things can be done, such as saving suspected conduits that are being lynched, and freeing suspected conduits from imprisonment. You can earn evil karma by executing injured civilians, denying an enemy's submission, destroying suspected conduits in the prisons holding them, or killing sign spinners and street performers. Now up to this point, if you were new to the series, then you might think that your karmic rank only affects your clothes, however that is not the only thing affected by your karma. Some of the dialogue in the story itself will change depending on your karmic rank, but we can talk about that later. For now, let's talk about the new powers you get with your karmic rank. As you collect more upgrade points and obtain new powers, you'll see that certain powers are locked behind a karmic rank, and this encourages you to continue with your heroic or villainous deeds. An upgrade received for the invisibility is the Wingmen. This upgrade gives you an angelic minion that'll help you while you're invisible and does some damage to enemies while also drawing aggro. The minion stays around until it's killed, even after you become visible again. The good karma upgrade allows you to subdue two enemies before becoming visible again and enhances the duration of the ability. An evil playthrough, however, would allow you to summon two demons instead of one angel, and eventually the unholy trinity which encourages a more aggressive approach. These upgrades complement the playstyle associated with the different karma ranks, as on an evil playthrough you would receive more aggressive upgrades such as the unholy trinity or getting a larger boost from smoke vents, or being able to fire lasers more rapidly with neon, or having the cinder blast completely disintegrate the enemies caught within it. I could go on, but I could at least leave some surprises for you guys, and discussing further points would just be sort of redundant. The biggest issue with the karma system is its linearity. Even if it's your first time playing the game, it's clear that the gameplay doesn't dictate the karma. The karma dictates the gameplay. Even if it might be easier to be more reckless and just kill the enemies, the desire for a certain ending will constrain you to be the goody two-shoes. The way the karma system presents itself is mind-numbing, as it's very clear what the morally correct answer is in any situation. And that's not even considering the way the game highlights the morally correct decision in blue, and the morally incorrect decision in red. I wonder why they don't give you more choices than just good or bad. Why not have four options with them being good, bad, kinda good, kinda bad, and make these decisions fall into a moral gray area. One of the first decisions in the game goes like this. We as Delson have just realized that we are a conduit and are tasked with chasing an escaped convict who is also a conduit. Upon leaving a building, we see that the convict gets killed and we get interrogated by Brooke Augustine. And she says that we have to talk and if we don't, she'll put the rest of the tribe through a lot of pain and fatally wound them. Your decision is to either come clean. I'm a conduit. What? I said, I'm a conduit. 
All right? I caught it a second ago from... from that guy. Oh, you caught it. Very funny. Ah! God! Tell him. Ah! Or tell her off. Piss off. Then I have no further use for you. Ah! Hope you're not as stubborn as that one. Are you, Betty? When looking at the decisions, they flat out tell you that the good decision is the first step to becoming a hero and that the bad decision is the first step to becoming infamous. From the very first decision, you are deciding what ending you want, the heroic ending or the villainous ending. A way that they could improve on this would be making the decisions gray, literally, and avoid highlighting the decisions with the corresponding karma color. Another improvement would be the description of the decision. Don't flat out say that this is the first step to becoming a hero, but instead have a description that furthers the intensity of the decision. We already saw that Augustine is okay with killing, so have the description clarify that if we come clean, we will die. And if we sell out the tribe, there's a good chance that we will still die and that the tribe might sell us out. No matter what decision you make, Delson gets knocked out, and then we wake up and we see the the entire tribe is in critical condition, and this sets up our motivation for the game. I understand that previous games in the series may have done this better, but like I said, this video isn't a comparison. This problem of choices not having much of an impact on the story is an issue that shows up throughout the entire game. To further illustrate this point, I'm going to give a brief summary of the story highlighting the major decisions within the game. The story begins with Delson and his brother Reggie seeing a DUP truck crash in the middle of the street, and upon touching the conduit's hand, Delson gains their power. After a chase ensues, they meet with Augustine, and the decision I just mentioned happens. With the goal in sight of needing Augustine's concrete power to save the tribe, they head to Seattle to power up, and once there, they find a conduit named Fetch, who has the power of Neon. After catching her and getting her power, we have the decision of her fate, and whether we should corrupt or redeem her. After that decision, we eventually head downtown and confront the next conduit, Eugene. This decision is a bit of deja vu, as we have the option of either redeeming or corrupting him. Directly after this decision, we run into the smoke conduit named Hank from the start of the game, who explains that Augustine didn't kill him, and instead locked him up in her tower and after trusting that he'll show us the way in, he betrays us, which ends up with the death of Reggie. After escaping Augustine's grasp, we track down Hank and are given the option to spare him or kill him. After that, we go straight to Augustine, decide to either kill or expose Augustine, and after that, the game ends. I'll go into these decisions a bit more, but first, let's talk about the lack of change in the overall story. It's clear that no matter what decision you make, the story only briefly branches off, and no matter what, the key story points are always there. If your actions are properly affected by the story, then the point where a decision is made would allow the story to branch off permanently rather than just branching off for a short period. When making a decision to redeem or corrupt one of the conduits, you then play two missions with them as a sidekick, and your decision to corrupt them, for example, plays out in dialogue. As for Fetch, you guys would discuss making more evil decisions, but outside of those two missions, her dialogue is the exact same, and it's no different than if you were to redeem them, and convince them to use their powers for good. Another aspect that shows the lack of impact on the story is Reggie. He is a cop, and as such, has a pretty clear moral code, and spoiler alert, he's killed just before the climax of the game. If you were a hero throughout the story, then Reggie's last words are, Dad, I'm so proud of you. No. Always have been. No. Lindsay, don't. I love you, bro. No! This is very touching, and it makes the death hit so much harder. What doesn't make sense is that if you have been a villain the entire game, and you've corrupted multiple conduits and killed thousands of dupes, and have blatantly assaulted innocents, then he says the exact same thing, and the entire level and boss fight that ensues after is the exact same, except your hoodie color is different. Dad, I'm so proud of you. No. Always have been. No. Lindsay, don't. I love you, bro. No! This criticism can be applied to any major story point, such as when you choose to either corrupt or spare fetch. If you choose to corrupt her, then you and Reggie get into a very clear scrap, but no matter what, he just sort of gets over and then the story continues. What, huh? A bioterrorist with a body count? I love you, Reg. Don't make me break that handsome nose of yours. Bye. Hope she kills someone's father tomorrow, or mother the day after that. You're the one that I'm not that damn man. Trying to stay alive. If you won't do it for me, then do it for the tribe. Fine, what do you need? Thank you. 
I initially planned to go over every decision in detail, but it's so clear to me that there's no point in going over them, as they don't really change anything, and only one decision has a long-lasting effect, and even then, the effect is barely anything of note. The decision I'm mentioning involves the ending. The good ending of the game sees Delson exposing Augustine for the corrupted villain she is, and it sees Delson freeing all the captive conduits from the DUP prison, Curtin K. He then goes back home and rescues the tribe. Take the evil route, however, and you'll kill Augustine and publicly humiliate her, before starting a corrupt conduit uprising. And you'll still open the gates to Kurt and Kay, however, when you go to save the tribe, you're disowned by the tribe's leader, Betty. You are a comish. No longer. And upon her closing the door on your face, you decide to kill the tribe. In spectacular fashion, mind you. Both these endings are pretty good, and it's cool to see the way Delson talks about the tribe in each ending. In the good ending, he claims he has a promise to keep. Now I had a promise to keep. But in the bad ending, he says he has a promise to take care of. At first, I had a promise to take care of. Which says a lot about how in the evil ending he sees the tribe as just sort of a loose end, a thorn in his side, just a chore. Something interesting about these endings is that there's a slightly altered evil ending if you decide to spare Hank. If you spare Hank but continue on your evil playthrough, after being disowned by the tribe, the game just ends. No orbital dropped, just the credits. Now, I know this isn't a huge change, but it's at least something, and it's the only time the game does something like this, so I figured I'd at least mention it. At this point, we've covered pretty much everything in the game aside from the characters, and funny enough, it's one of the most controversial points of the game. Let's start with the most controversial of all of them. Delson. People's biggest complaint with Delson is his douchiness. I know it's not the most formal way to describe how people see him, but I feel it's the most accurate, and I want to say that I agree to an extent. No matter what karma playthrough you go through, Delson is a bit of a jackass who jokes around too much, is a little full of himself, and makes mistakes, which in my opinion is what makes him such a good character. For some reason, a lot of people prefer a character with no flaws, but I just can't agree with that. Because a good character is a character you can relate to, and a character that goes through a change with a complete arc. Delson starts the game lost. He's in a limbo where he, I presume, doesn't have a job and spends his days just killing time without a purpose, spray painting billboards. It's actually kind of sad when you think about it. It's clear from the first cutscene that he's a delinquent within his community, but he's good at heart and has likely suffered a loss before the events of the game, illustrated through this moment in the beginning of the game. Right when Reggie mentions their parents, Delson rears his head back and puts an offended expression on, as if making his parents proud is something so important to him and that's not a good talking point between them because he knows as much as Reggie does that he probably isn't making them proud. I think the situation that Delson is in is a relatable one. I think we've all been in a place at one point or another in our lives where we were just lost like he was. We're just doing things in the day and going through the motions, but we're just complacent. Just sitting there, pissing the days away because we feel like we don't really have a purpose. Sure, his confidence and quick wit is still a core part of his personality, and he still has desires and goals, but he's frozen without any way to make himself feel special or any way to really do something. This changes when he gains his powers. At first, he's scared. Oh my god. Oh my god. Make it stop! Reds! Reg, I really need you! He's already seen as an outsider with his own tribe, with the only one not scolding him or just not caring at all being a pseudo mother figure Betty, and being a conduit would be the final straw to push him to being an official social outcast, and he's terrified. The village and Reggie talk about being a conduit like it's a disease, a sickness, and Delson feels this way too. And this is shown through the way Delson basically collapses into Reggie. Man, I can't stop it. Reggie, I can't it's okay. stop it's okay. it, man. It's okay. You're okay. Just breathe. Breathe. You're all right. You're right. I'm one of them, man. I'm no. one of them. No. 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 You are my brother. All right? You are my brother. Okay. This thing with you is gonna pass. I promise. We'll fix it. All right? You with me? You with me? Okay. Okay. You get out there. Once he sees that the only person who can save his tribe is himself, he finds a purpose. The way Delson acts speaks a lot more than words do. A line that is often proposed to show why Delson is a bad character is during the interrogation with Augustine, where Delson says this. It's been my experience there are only two reasons for people to be nervous. Either they're cowards, or they have something to hide. Well, you know, I also get nervous around pretty girls. 
You this line was cheeky and a little stupid, and in case you didn't notice, Delson's aware of this. He tried to talk himself out of a tough situation, and immediately after saying something, he drops and shakes his head as if to say, you idiot, why did you say that? I don't think that subtly calling out a bad joke for being bad alleviates it from being criticized. However, it's clear that the point of this line was to show that Delson doesn't always think before he speaks, and that he's a little impulsive. His rebellious side shows through these cutscenes too, if not through his outfit and habit of graffiti. The only real issue I have with Delson and I know this might be a nitpick, but whatever, is the way he acts sometimes. In the good playthrough, he says a lot of things that just don't really make sense for his character overall. In a good guy playthrough, you end up redeeming Eugene, and in the cutscene following that, Delson seems like he's trying too hard to act like a cool guy, and he talks about getting laid, and here, I'll just show you. So, what do you say, Eugene? You, me, a couple of conduits hit the town, you show me some of your new video tricks, I show you how to pick up some girls, maybe rescue some of our marked brethren. I don't think so, but I still feel safer in here. Come on, man, you keep staying down here and playing angels and demons, you're never gonna get laid. You see what I mean? Meanwhile, in the cutscene following the choice to corrupt Eugene, he's way more relaxed and nice about getting Eugene out there. So, Eugene, my brother, what do you say? You and me, a couple conduits, we hit the town, you teach me some of those video tricks, I teach you how to pick up girls, and we take our power to the people. Well, I'd like to find the Russians that were picking on the suspected conduits and kicking the shit out of them for a change. Dude, I wanna party with you. The date then, yeah? I almost feel like these two scenes should have been swapped. This was, however, the only time in which I found Dawson to be this way. I don't want to propose that the story in Dawson as a character is some deep dive into mental health, but it's definitely a really good story about finding a purpose. And from this point onward, I need to talk about hero and villain Dawson as two different characters, because despite both starting out the same, he really can evolve into a kind-hearted bringer of justice, or a self-centered malicious angel of death. Unfortunately, there isn't a massive change in Dawson aside from the phone calls during the game. For example, when climbing the space you know, it's good, Delson. We hear this. Hey there. It's Betty. Where are you? Oh, hi, Betty. I'm at the Space Needle. Oh, I'll, I'll try back later then. Bring me a postcard. <laughs> okay, if the gift shop's open. Bye, Betty. Bye bye, dear. However, as bad Delson, we hear this. Delson Rowe, you hung up on me before. Sorry, Betty, but, uh... Don't tell me this is a bad time, too. Actually, at the moment, I'm <laughs> kind of climbing up the outside of the Space Needle. Well, if you don't want to talk to me, just say so. Gonna have to call you back, Betty. Slight differences. Another example is when Delson is trying to stop a conduit from jumping off a crane downtown. Here's what good Delson says. No, 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 don't! Whoa, nice catch, wingman. And here is what bad Delson says. Ugh. God, after I climbed up all this way. God, angel bastard, should have let him fall. Could have maybe drain something off the corpse. The way the UI messages adjust to his karma is really cool too, as when battling Augustine and kicking her, notice that on the good playthrough it says Tyrant Wounded, however on the evil playthrough it says Authority Wounded. These differences help with the overall aesthetic of each playthrough, as when at the karmic rank of Infamous, Delson looks visibly restless and sick, as if he really is corrupted, and the symbol on his vest is an intimidating bird's skull that symbolizes fear, anguish, and rebellion. However, at the rank of true hero, he looks healthy, and the symbol on his back is a flying bird that symbolizes freedom and harmony. Delson's biggest ally is his brother Reggie, who is a really great character. Reggie has an indirect role in the conduit activities of his brother through showing him the locations of the core relays, but despite this, there's a disconnect as he still sees his brother's powers as something to be fixed. This is illustrated when Delson at one point in the story loses all of his powers. He gets excited because this is what he wanted all along, for things to just go back to normal, much to Delson's dismay. He begs Reggie to help him get his powers back, and Reggie almost doesn't do it, but he realizes that he's sort of in too deep at this point and decides to do it for Delson and the tribe. The disconnect from him and his brother is shown when we see the leftovers of Hank's killing spree later on in the story. Delson has to take pictures of the bodies and send it to Reggie, and the way he responds is great. This is what it looks like when you... I've avoided looking up close. Hey man, they do the same thing to me. He didn't quite realize how brutal the superpowers are, and this one scene, I think, adds a lot to his character. Reggie also goes through a change in his prejudice against conduits. All right, we're gonna fix this thing. <sighs> gonna find you a cure. A cure? 
But shooting smoke out of your fingertips isn't exactly normal, man. Just because it's not normal doesn't mean that it needs a cure. Definitely new and improved. Delson, this is not improved, man. We're trying to fix the problems you already have, not add new ones. No, dude, no way. Look, just because you have the same affliction, not gift, affliction, doesn't mean that we're gonna pick up every little piece of trash we find. Listen to me. He took suspected conduits right off the street. Yeah. Against their will. That's kidnapping. Okay, don't go anywhere. First of all, thank you for using the word conduit. Second of all, why are you being such a dick? Reg, what, what are you doing here? Look, those are people over there. They need our help. Not bioterrorists, not conduits. People. Well, thank you. A lot of comparisons can be drawn to the prejudice of conduits, to the real-life racism of our own world, but unfortunately, that is definitely not a topic I want to get into. Regardless, Reggie eventually learns that just because someone is a conduit doesn't mean that they're a monster, and as Delson proves that through his heroic deeds, Reggie starts referring to Delson's powers as gifts rather than symptoms. Now, of course, we can't talk about Reggie without talking about his unfortunate death. Reggie's death scene, as I mentioned earlier, hits pretty hard on the good playthrough. His final words to Delson completes his arc in a way, as saying that he He's proud of him implies that he's proud of what Delson has done with his powers, since he's used his powers for good. This is also, as I mentioned earlier, entirely ruined by the fact that even on the evil playthrough, he still says he's proud of him, so I can't praise the game too much for this, but while we're on the topic of this scene, I do want to point out that this really is a great scene, as when Delson gets up, he seems visibly both defeated and infuriated and his animations reflect this. When doing an orbital drop, he's showing so much anger that he drops in fist first. Fetch and Eugene are unfortunately the weaker aspects of the game as they complete their arcs within two missions essentially and are pretty shallow. In Fetch's case, she's super standoffish to Delson, however, after what is essentially one night in the form of a mission, she either completely stops killing or doubles down on her killing of drug dealers and starts moving on to innocence. Eugene goes through his arc of leaving his hideout and does so by either killing people or not killing people. I don't really want to get into it though because no matter what, they still act the same way during story segments outside of those two missions. There's also a few setups for Delson and Fetch having a relationship that is expanded upon in the evil playthrough, but it doesn't really go anywhere outside of these missions either. Brooke Augustine, however, is a very interesting case, as she is a really neat villain with a really cool boss fight that I'll talk more about later. She has layers to her character, and eventually by the end you understand that while she is definitely in the wrong, you don't really blame her for making the decisions that she did. In the beginning of the game, you're under the impression that she is a killer, because you saw her kill Hank, but as Hank eventually explains, what she did was just trap him and make him easy to transport. You then see that after the events of Infamous 2, she and the little girl woke up with powers, hers being concrete and the little girl's being paper. When the military threatened to shoot them, Augustine gave the little girl to the military, claiming that she was on their side, and through that, gained their trust. I honestly might have done the same thing in that case. I mean, I don't know what else she could have done. Then with the military's trust, she obtained funding for the DUP, and with it, is able to make Curtain K, where the conduits are kept. Not killed, but kept. She explains that it was the best way to protect her people. You find out that she actually was doing too good of a job, and that the government was starting to think that the DUP wasn't needed anymore. And so she intentionally trained Fetch, Eugene, and Hank, and let them escape so that she could send out her DUP to capture them and show the world that they still needed her. You find out a lot of this through her boss fight, which we might as well talk about now as it's the climax of the game. After the death of Reggie, we have our first match with Augustine, where we're essentially launching rockets into her until she falls over. Then we finish her with an awesome orbital drop. Once hitting her with another finishing move, you take her entire fort down and you're washed up on shore. This boss fight's arena was really cool overall and I wish I had more to say on it, but I don't. It's really just good. The rematch, however, is a bit of a different story. Initially, the fight starts off like the one before, but after launching a hellfire swarm on her, she eventually gives in and decides to give you her power. This, of course, was a strategic move, because now Delson is using concrete on concrete, but Augustine's been training for seven years. She then goes all out and transforms into a bunch of different concrete monsters, which all look so awesome, and Delson, having no powers at this point, has to just survive as long as he can while he waits for Eugene to deliver more core relay so he can gain more concrete abilities. This allows the battle's tide to gradually turn, and while some might argue that it would have been more satisfying to use the powers you gained up to that point, I think the way this is played out worked well enough for me, as I personally preferred the Concrete on Concrete showdown. It would make sense for Augustine to give Delson Concrete, as it gives her a huge advantage too. Unfortunately, Concrete is easily the worst power in the game. We might as well talk about it now, Concrete overall just feels very underwhelming, as it is essentially what the entire game has been leading up to, and the power itself just feels underdeveloped. The biggest evidence of this is the 
fact that there isn't even a special move for the power. While the other powers have the orbital drop, radial burst, and the hellfire swarm, concrete gets nothing. It just feels very bare bones, and I honestly never really used it because the other powers were more fun, and I felt like concrete could have easily been expanded upon. For example, you could have a variation of the sulfur bomb where you throw a piece of concrete on the ground that bursts, leaving your enemy stunned with concrete shrapnel in their legs, similar to what Augustine does to you and the tribe at the beginning of the game. As for a super move, they could have an attack where Delson lifts himself into the air, collecting concrete from the ground, which forms a giant concrete monster that does a body slam into the ground, breaking the mold as it hits. The abilities you do get just feel like reskins of previous moves, such as the boulder dash, which is just the neon sprint but without the ability to run up walls. However, you can tank damage while in this dash. The bursts of concrete that can be fired from your hands just feel like a concrete version of the video torrent. The concrete barrage which sees you firing a line of concrete looks cool and does a ton of damage, but it doesn't beat out any of the other powers necessarily. There were a multitude of situations where I thought to myself, I could definitely use neon right now, or hey, maybe video would help me approach this battle better, but I never had a thought of, hey, I should use concrete. Even though I had concrete, I never really used it much to them post game, despite having a bunch of side quests to do. I think Augustine though is a really good villain, and with all the characters talked about now, I can certainly say that the characters are good. I know I criticized Fetch and Eugene a lot, but I do think they're still fun characters and they do have really neat designs. The way the game presents its story and characters are well done, and it has subtle details that enrich the characters. The story has a lot of potential, and while it does a lot right, it does stumble a little bit. I'm left feeling like the karma system in the game hinders and constrains the story more than it expands it. And that kind of goes for gameplay too. The karma system is something that I've criticized a lot in this video, and while it's nowhere near perfect, I don't think it ruins the game by any means. The game is so good despite the many flaws it has, and while I've talked about all the flaws in this game, I really need to stress that what it does right, it does so right. And the game is still so much fun to play. It's still my favorite game of all time despite its flaws, and I think you guys, if you haven't played the game to this point, really, you should just give it a try as it's a great time. Just don't go looking for a spectacular story or a complex morality system. Just jump in Seattle, take out some dupes, and enjoy your powers. Hi guys, thank you so much for making it to the end of this really, really long video. I appreciate you guys for uh, for watching to the end if you did make it. Um, I know this video was long, and believe me when I tell you, there's still so much stuff that I wanted to talk about, but I couldn't because it was just like, the video was really long and I didn't want to sound redundant and I didn't want to be too boring and it was just really, really wild. So yeah, I just appreciate you guys a lot. And uh, if you appreciate my content, you'll probably appreciate Nam12399. He makes really good video essays and he actually just put out a review for Persona 5 Royal. So definitely go check that out, you won't regret it. I'd also like to give a shout out to myself, uh, my Twitch page, I stream semi-regularly on Twitch. Right now we're doing a playthrough of Catherine because I can't put the game down. We've been playing it for like a month now. Um, and it's a, it's a really fun time. Oh, I so misjudged that. God, oh, that, that, this hurts, this hurts, this hurts, no. Oh. Go over here. <laughs> Go over there. Hey, 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 we did it. <laughs> Man, I went I pressed down. Fuck. I was so close. I'd also like to give a big shout out to our patrons. Uh, our gold tier patrons, of course, A Beat and Pyrite, and our silver tier patrons, Ghostly Gaming, and our bronze tier patrons, Ashwin. If you want to see the videos up to one week early, as well as getting some behind the scenes stuff like the scripts for the videos and the raw voiceover and gameplay, as well as some Patreon exclusive live streams, feel free to check out my Patreon. Um, that's basically all I have to say for now. I really appreciate you guys for making it to the end of this if you did, and thank you so much for 10,000 subscribers. That's like really wild i <laughs> like that's like it, it sounds stupid but like i could never even dream of that man like it's just really it, it's it's really crazy so um anyways uh i'm gonna go i love you guys a lot i appreciate you all i'm gonna shut up now goodbye